for us here at uh, the DA, we strive for many years already to have uh, equal opportunities for men and women. Um, I mean, this academy was founded by a woman. We should always remember. <laughs> uh, even if uh, students at that time were, of course, mostly men. But uh, in the, um, I would say, last decades, uh, we are happy that we have so many uh, women students. This year, we have 56% uh, students that are women and 44% that are men. And also in our academic personnel, uh, we are almost gender equal. Uh, we have seven men and uh, six women teaching and lecturing. So we strive for next year really to have a totally equal number, if possible, with seven men and seven women. Uh, in our conferences, which is also a very act, um, uh, uh, active activity, I would say, in, in, in the academy, um, we try and we always remember the organizers also to have um, a gender balanced um, participation in the panels, if that is possible. Yes, it's not always the case, unfortunately. Sometimes um, panels can be only men, um, but really it's something we really always uh, point to, to have uh, uh, this uh, gender balanced. So I'm particularly happy, of course, that tonight we have uh, so many women uh, on this panel. Uh, I regret, however, personally, that um, there's no gender balance tonight in the panel. <laughs> so uh, this is something we still have to work on, and we will drive, uh, strive to achieve this, I hope, next year. So I will not be uh, longer. I will pass the floor now to Amb Ambassador Blaha. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Martina. Thank you to the Diplomatic Academy for hosting us here tonight. Um, I'm the vice president of this uh, alumni club of the Diplomatic Academy. It's one of the oldest uh, alumni associations in Austria. It was founded in uh, 1969. And we have now almost uh, 1,900 members in 125 countries. This is more than half of the whole alumni uh, community. And we are very happy um, and encourage, of course, all students uh, to join, to become a member. Um, we have uh, 15 active local chapters in different countries. The latest one was created, established in Italy with two different locations, Rome and, and Milano. And the club has uh, different activities. You can see from our roll up here. So we are trying to uh, bring together or keep together the uh, alumni uh, community with the uh, students and the faculty of the Diplomatic Academy. Um, we give uh, opportunity for career um, advice, career services. In fact, next week there is an annual event where um, 23 or 24 different companies uh, come here. Uh, over 100, I think 120 students uh, have asked for appointments and about 500 um, talks will take place in three hours in the afternoon. <laughs> um, so this is one of the things we do. We also have a mentorship uh, program uh, that we do together with the Rotary Club. And um, we are also giving scholarships uh, in the last 10 years, we have spent more than 100,000 um, euros on uh, scholarships, mostly, um, I, I think it's about five every year, and um, the majority of them also go to, um, to women. The, uh, the club also has an um, internet platform, uh, they are Connect, and a, a bi-weekly newsletter is sent out to about 2,500 people. 
I'm happy to be here today, and this is the third time that we are organizing this event together with Rotary Club uh, Vienna Maria Theresia and SAGE, the Student Association for the Advancement of Gender Equality, and you will hear from their representatives now, and I invite Johanna to come up to the floor. Thank you. Okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, distinguished guest Ambassador Blaha, um, on behalf of Rotary Vienna Maria Theresia, um, I would also like to welcome you briefly to this evening to um, a special and hopefully um, enriching and, and challenging panel discussion dedicated to um, the strength, the resilience, and the achievements of women. And um, before um, going into like, the significance of International Women's Day, let me just introduce our Rotary Club briefly. Um, we were founded in 2020 um, at the Diplomatic Academy. Most of our founding members are graduates of the Academy, like myself. Uh, we are one of the two English-speaking Rotary Clubs in Vienna, currently just over 40 members from around 20 different countries, more women than men. And, um, and, we've, and one of our um, distinguishing characteristics in the club is that we switch between women and, and a male um, president. So um, our founding president was a man, second president was uh, Vera Badwe, who is our moderator tonight. Third president was Sasha Munzman, who is here as well, and I'm president number four, and president number five will be an Italian gentleman. So it's, we, we yeah. And so, um, again, so, so before, um, I will then um, hand over in a few moments to my colleague Lara from, from SAGE, and before we do, um, dive into this evening filled with like, empowerment, insights, and hopefully plenty of food for thought, and it's, uh, and there will be an informal part after the panel discussion so where you can uh, continue your, uh, the discussion, the, the, the networking in smaller circles. Um, let's maybe take a moment to also reflect on International Women's Day. And um, so in, in addition to International Women's Day being a celebration of the achievements of, of, of women um, all around the globe, um, I would all like personally, um, and I hope that many of you will agree, International Women's Day is also like a, a call for action for more gender equality, for more diversity, an opportunity to also highlight the challenges women still face in various aspects of their life, social, cultural, political, career related. So it's not, and therefore like International Women's Day should not just be a day or it, it's more like a movement and hopefully in, in the years to come, uh, also like a celebration of progress. Mm -hmm. And as I pointed out just now, also a call for, for, for action. So this, this panel discussion tonight, uh, this joint event, we are, um, are glad to be able to organize with the DA and the Club DA, um, will bring together diverse um, perspectives from four different um, industries. Uh, not only for different perspective, but also experiences that each of the panelists will, will bring to the table. And this, this also brings me back to, to Rotary. And um, here, let me just underline that we in our club and Rotary in general believes in like the power of diversity, in, in the power of networking. So we, as Rotary Vienna, Maria Therese, are also proud to um, um, like amplify the voices of, of, of women who can who continue to inspire us with their um, resilience, their leadership, and their um, dedication. So before I hand over to, to Lara from, from SAGE, let me just um, express my sincere gratitude to everyone who contributed to making this event possible, the Diplomatic Academy, the Alumni Association at Club DA, the DA um, event and alumni team, and of course, like you, the audience, we um, expect you to ask questions, critical questions. And so without further ado, um, thank you very much from my, uh, from my side and I'll hand over to you, Lara, for your comments. Thank you very much, Johanna. And uh, good evening also from my side. My name is Lara Ottendorfer and I am part of this year's society um, board from the Students Advocating Gender Equality, or SAGE in short. 
What we at SAGE aim to do is to bring people really together from external experts to our student body in order to facilitate meaningful discussions and raise also awareness about the importance of gender equality. To add on to a bit what Johanna just mentioned, um, International Women's Day should be a day of celebration um, for standing up for women's rights all over the world and for celebrating equality and the progress that has been achieved so far. However, it should also be a crucial moment or day um, to think, to reflect on the persisting challenges that we are still faced with in Austria, but also all over the world. To take the example of Austria, um, we are um, the second, Austria has the second largest gender pay gap uh, in all of the European Union, just after Estonia, and also uh, is among the highest ranked countries regarding um, gender-based violence in the European Union. With seven femicides, we are all, I think, aware of this number uh, in just two short months of 2024. So it is more important, perhaps, than ever um, to really invest in women and also accelerate the progress in order to make gender equality possible throughout all sectors. And I would like to close now with uh, a short quote that I have um, prepared from Ambassador Tormod Endresen, permanent representative of Norway to the United Nations in Geneva currently, who put it in the way, um, not least if we are to accelerate progress for all, the answer is simple, to invest in women. Thank you very much for being here tonight. I wish you a fruitful discussion, and I now may hand over to Vera Badwe, and yeah, wish you a good evening. So good evening, everyone. Thank you so much. My name is Vera Budwe. I'll be moderating today's panel. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. And again, from my part and my side, I would also like to thank the DA, the club DA, and, and Sage uh, for joining us again with a Rotary Vienna Maria Theresa for what I think is now becoming an annual event to recognize International Women's Day. I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to moderate this panel and to discuss with uh, our, our prominent speakers the topic of investing in women, accelerating progress. Um, as we know, when we invest in women, everyone wins. Societies are more stable, they're more peaceful, they're more prosperous. According to some estimates uh, that, reduce, that say that reducing the gender gap in the labor market participation by 25% by 2025 could raise the global GDP by 3.9% or $5.8 trillion. So as we can see, investing in women means business and it is really a win-win for all. So I'm, in, I'm joined here by this uh, great group of women who will share some thoughts on and their experiences on the importance of investing in women and the impact it has on communities, businesses, and society as a whole. So I will, I'm happy to introduce our, our panelists today. Uh, right to my, my right uh, is Andrea Bashov haga from CARE Austria. Andrea is the CEO of CARE Austria. CARE is one of the world's leading development and humanitarian aid agencies fighting poverty and injustice in over 100 countries and helping more than 170 million people each year with a specific focus also on the empowerment of women and girls. So welcome, Andrea. Yeah. To my left, I am joined by Tuba Ersoy. Tuba is Director of Human Resources and Corporate Communications and Organization at Denise Bank here. Tuba is an international HR leader with over 25 years of experience. She successfully managed complex HR projects across various geographies with a focus on the United States, the Middle East, and the EU markets. Tuba began her career in hospitality and prior to joining Denise Banks, she worked in executive search and HR consulting. She holds a master's degree from the Wirtschaftsuniversität in finance and banking and participated in a wide range of executive coaching programs throughout her career. So welcome, Tuba. 
to my far right, we have Heather Looney. Uh, Heather serves as section head for the Division of Nuclear Security, Nuclear Materials and Facilities at the International Atomic Age Energy Agency. She has two decades of experience in nuclear security and non-proliferation issues. She worked in a, vari a variety of roles at the United States Department of Energy's National Nuclear Security Administration, focusing on issues of physical protection, safeguards, export controls, and non-proliferation policy. Heather graduated from the University of South Carolina with a bachelor's in international studies and holds a master's from Georgetown University, my alma mater, <laughs> in Russian studies. She lives in Vienna with her husband and her five-month-old daughter. So welcome, Heather. And to my far left, we have Doris Lippert. Doris is Director, Global Partner Solutions of Microsoft Austria and Deputy President of the Association of Austrian Software Innovations. Doris is a senior IT manager with 15 years plus experience of IT and in IT leadership and communication. She joined Microsoft in 2017 and previously led consulting services and digital advisory and change consulting. Uh, since 2021, Doris is a member of the management board of Microsoft Austria. As a mother of two daughters, she is particularly committed to more diversity and empowerment of women in the IT industry. So welcome, Doris. So before we start our discussion, maybe I also want to address the elephant in the room that was raised, that we do have an all-female panel, and I know, um, Martina, you mentioned uh, that we do strive for more equality and gender diversity in panels, but today we are joined by women, but that doesn't mean we don't want to hear the voices from men. We cannot have gender equality without men um, and uh, male ad allies and support. So. In, in order for us to really progress and accelerate, yes, we need all on board. So I'm looking forward to having, hearing the voices of our male colleagues uh, then in the discussion afterwards. And I'm so glad we have so many men joining us today and so many men supporting us in our fight for greater gender equality. So with that, uh, with that introduction, I'd like to introduce the format. We're going to have two rounds of questions with the panelists, and then I will open the floor for your questions and comments. Um, and then we'll have a closing round, followed by a, uh, a reception afterwards where we can discuss more and network. So without further ado, let's get started with the first round of questions. Um, this round will focus on the topic of investing in women, which is the actually the title or the theme for this year's uh, International Women's Day. And I'll start with you, Andrea. And the question is, gender equality and women's economic empowerment are one of the focuses of CARE and the work you do. I mean, can you give us an example of how CARE invests in women and girls so they can become more economically and also financially um, independent? Yes, thank you. Uh, CARE is taking a very comprehensive uh, approach to this issue. And uh, I will focus on, I think, the most powerful examples. As we have heard before, CARE fights poverty globally. This is, in a nutshell, what CARE is doing as a global organization. And we are working in all the emergency settings, in all the catastrophes that you hear every day about, and we are also working in so-called long-term development and overlapping uh, regions. Because we see in many cases, let's start with the example of emergency, Syria next week will be 13 years of war. We will commemorate that. That's nothing to commemorate. That's a tragedy for millions of people in Syria, in the whole region, in the neighboring countries, in Europe. And talking about the lost generation, we are not talking only about children. We are not talking only about uh, girls and boys. We are talking about both. Yeah, and in Syria, we really face what it means that we have a lost generation. And Syria is one of the chronic crises in the Middle East. In the meantime, we have many more 
in the region. And along with war, and this is also true for Ukraine and for all the other wars that we are seeing, these are crises that have underlying causes that are impacted by climate change, by inequality, and by many, many things. So millions of people are suffering. So in emergency, it is very important, and I, I'm very clear on that, care is always helping men and women, as you mentioned, always. But we have a strong focus on girls and on women. And some of you might think now, in a case of war, in a case of emergency, why do you need a focus on girls and women? Because they are affected in a very different way than men. And I have seen it myself a thousand of times that we have to have special, not only care packages, because this is old fashioned, but special help for girls and for women. We need to support them when they are pregnant. We need to support them how to take care of their babies. I don't know if you are aware, hundreds and thousands of kids are now uh, born in Gaza in these war circumstances, which is really devastating. I'm very clear, CARE is working there, and we are absolutely against the terroristic attack that has taken place on 7th of October. So, in emergencies, we have to focus on women and girls to make sure that they receive what they need, because what is different today in comparison to 20 years ago, that wars take longer, crisis takes much longer, it's not going in and out after a few months. If a crisis starts, we are there for years, normally. So, the other thing that we have to do apart from war situation is income generating, and also in chronic war situations, this is a big issue. What should people live from? Sitting in a refugee camp is not very satisfying. I, can, I, I don't have the experience myself, but I have visited numerous uh, around the globe. And you have to generate income to really make a living. Nowhere in the world it is enough what you receive from the state or from international donors. We are not talking about comfortable life, we are talking about pure survival. So what CARE is doing, we, gener we create, and if I say we, it is not people like me. It's always people from the country we are working in, 100%. So this is really important to know. And we motivate people to really create an income for themselves. And you mentioned it in your opening uh, statement that if women generate income, then it's for the whole family. Yes, but it's a generalization because there are many men around the world who also take care of their families. So I just, want to, I just want to mention that. But it's true that overall, and if we allow us to generalize, that the income of women is dedicated mainly to family members and not so much uh, on outside spending. So in refugee camps, we encourage women to become sort of entrepreneurial. And there are special trainings uh, provided by CARE where women who sometimes have attended school, sometimes not, get chances not only to have a good structure in their day, but also to generate income. I will finish with one because it's very complex and there are many examples to share. But let me share one from, this, from a setting where we don't uh, face a war or emergency situation. These are saving groups. I'm sure you have heard about it. These are small saving groups, 30 to 50 women in remote areas. We do that all over the world, uh, more than 25 years. And there is no funding from outside. The seed funding comes from the women themselves. And it's not only about the saving and the loans that they uh, are organizing within these groups. It is about creating platforms for women to exchange to learn and to really come together and get together stronger. Because income generating is one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is knowing your rights and being able to execute them and having meaningful participation. Because uh, in this whole debate and in the development industry, <coughs> it's not enough to have 
lots of women around any table in the world. They have to have meaningful participation and to be meaningful, you have to be well equipped. And what equips everybody well? Education. And that's the key. And I stop here for the moment. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank, you. Thank, thank you so much. That was really, I think, very important. Two main things, of course, uh, to, to really emphasize that uh, women are disproportionately affected by conflict. We've seen that, as you've mentioned, um, in conflict set settings all over the world, and the importance of financial independence and financial literacy. And this is this income-generating activity where um, it, is, it is really crucial for women uh, to, to have that. And that's a very interesting example about these, these savings platforms, um, and I'd like to learn more about that afterwards. Um, let's move on to Tuba now. Uh, we're moving out now on to the private sector. Uh, Tuba, you're head of HR for a leading financial institution. Um, can you tell us a bit more about how Denise Bank invests in women, maybe both from internally, from your, your employees, and maybe also from the client side, if you are working with also your female clients, and maybe how do you personally uh, invest in women? Yes. Uh, first of all, I should say we are not as big as we are in Turkey. In Austria, we have around 350 uh, headcount, but I'm pr proud to share uh, is that we have reached 50% of women uh, headcount, which is amazing for us. Uh, our female board representation is 33%. Uh, we have three board members at the moment, and it's almost impossible to find female board members for finance industry. Worldwide, it's a big challenge. Top management, we have 41% female representation. Still, day by day, intentionally, we are working to increase these numbers. Yes, we do positive discrimination. If we face candidates with same qualities, we choose women over uh, men. This is how we proceed. And what we do is Denis Bank. Uh, we are, for our own employees, we are starting a big project this year with uh, called Women Leaders Empowerment Workshop Series. This is long, this is complicated, but the content is also very, very rich. This is with Sharon Ehrlich, she's with us uh, tonight, who already has uh, proven success in women empowerment in executive, female executive coaching. And what we aim to do here is that we would like to create a foundation, strong foundation for our women, women of Deniz Bank AG, to support them navigate business challenges while being a female, to learn to support each other within the company, to share, to become closer, also to help our external female, uh, female workers. So this is one project we have. Uh, we have another project. We chose our uh, NGO partner as Caritas this year. Unfortunately, I met Andrea today, and <laughs> we will also we will also start something as well. But we always choose a partner NGO every year. We change it, and we focus on the women. So our main focus is women at shelter houses. This year, last year we supported Fraunhofer of Vienna. I will also talk about it, and we will of course have financial support. Plus, our women at Denis Bank will be mentoring the women at. Um, Caritas at shelter houses. We will be trained for that. Also, we are designing a very interesting uh, financial literacy workshop for them so that we can support them in next chapters of their life. Also, uh, we will provide a scholarship. We have just uh, finalized our agreement with Diplomatische Academy. And as you can imagine, we will focus on female students uh, for next year's scholarship. This also excites us a lot. Uh, also, we have just supported two charity organizations for Fraunhofer of Vienna with Rotary International as Denis Bank employees by ourselves, which were really amazing projects for us. What I do personally is that I have two students pro from underprivileged areas. I support their uh, university life, and I also mentor them. I can see how lost they are, how difficult it is. So I also use the advantage of my HR background. So I, I'm always very close with them. I always have two students 
back to back. When they graduate, then I have another two. Plus, recently, I have discovered something else that I would like to share with you. I joined Plan International. Now I support uh, the education life of a girl called Erika from Africa. I don't know her, maybe I will never meet her, but it's, it feels so nice to support a girl in Africa who, are coming, who is coming from different conditions. So please check Plan, Plan International. It's also a very interesting uh, NGO project. Uh, she's seven years old, by the, by the way. I have a photo of her, but I don't know if I will be ever uh, meeting her. And of course, why invest in women? I'm I, everybody asking this uh, because we are doing this uh, transparent, positive uh, discrimination now, and we just tell them that we want to clean up the injustices that have been committed for centuries. If everything was normal, we were not discussing about these things. So now we do our best to close the gap. Thank you. Thank you so much. Again, thank you. Again, highlighting the very importance of financial literacy, education, um, and, and this is really how we can invest in women, and it's, it's great to hear that the private sector, especially the financial sector, is, is really taking, uh, taking the lead on this. So very important. As Thank you for your um, engagement. Now moving on to Heather. Uh, again, another sector. Mm -hmm. um, Heather, you are serving in a leading role and in a, of a very critical issue um, of the international nuclear and uh, radiology security. Um, and this is a very male-dominated field. Um, I think when you talk about nuclear energy, the first thing, you know, you usually think of, of male men. So, um, and, and what is being done to get more women uh, to play visible roles in the nuclear field. Maybe you can talk a bit more about what IAEA is doing to invest in women um, and how to break down the stereotypes. So really, how can uh, we get more girls actually involved in the type of sciences that could lead to careers like yours? Absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, thank you very much for the question. And thank you to the Diplomatic Academy and the Rotary Club for the opportunity to be here tonight on such a wonderful panel. It's so exciting hearing all these stories and different expertise. So for almost two years now, I have been at the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is a specialized UN agency that works to assist member states in their peaceful applications of nuclear and radiological materials and technologies. Everything from for nuclear power, uh, for educational purposes, research, and even some of the uh, radiological materials and applications that are used in medicine, for example, or in industry. And so I am responsible for the section that addresses the security of nuclear materials and facilities, which also includes radioactive materials. And uh, as, as noted by Vera, it is a very male-dominated field historically, the nuclear sector. In fact, worldwide, uh, the nuclear sector is only comprised of about 22% women. And so that is a very small number, but something that uh, we are working to change. With respect to the IAEA specifically, um, there is a lot of emphasis on gender equality. And this has been a particular uh, project of our current director general, Rafael Grossi. But we have in place a gender equality policy as well as a biennial uh, gender action plan. And there are a number of policies and measures in place that are working to do just that, to increase the representation of women, both at the IAEA as well as in the nuclear sector worldwide. And so at the IAEA, um, I mentioned the policies and the action plan, but uh, really this focuses a lot on ensuring um, adequate representation of women and participation and opportunity at all levels of recruitment and once they are onboarded at the agency. And so, uh, for example, we will track the number of applications coming in from women. With respect to positions, we'll look and make sure that a certain percentage of them are female. Obviously, if you have a low percentage, that probably tells you something. Did, did everybody see this application? Uh, you know, was this really, truly a fair and valid process? And so, we're working um, 
to ensure that kind of fairness and ensure that opportunities are advertised. Uh, and then, of course, working to actually get more women at the IAEA. And so uh, a lot of these policies and measures are paying off, and we see those results. So in 2019, we had about 32% of the IAEA's professional staff and above were female. Uh, since the institution of these policies and measures in 2020, we're now at uh, 40%. And we expect those numbers to rise because this is something that the agency is committed to. But it's not just about trying to get more women at the IAEA. As I mentioned, it's you know trying to increase female participation in the nuclear sector writ large. So we also do gender mainstreaming in our events and activities. And so what this looks like is we encourage participants uh, who are female, much like we encourage, encourage participants from uh, developing states to apply through their national mechanisms to come to our ed events. Uh, we do track the number of female participants in all of our events. That's something that we watch carefully and try to ensure that we are reaching out to women and getting them uh, to come to our events. But um, we also look at, for example, the number of female external experts that we invite as lecturers or trainers to our courses. Um, we make sure that there's gender parity there, make sure that we uh, have sufficient number of female experts that are listed in our expert uh, roster, for example, and uh, just try to ensure that we're representing and uh, allowing the representation of women. I can say within my division, the Division of Nuclear Security, a lot of these efforts particularly are paying off. In fact, just last year, we reached 50% uh, gender equality. So half of the women in the IEA's Division of Nuclear, half of the people rather, I should say, in the Division of Nuclear Security are female now, which is fantastic. So we are seeing the results on this. Um, which is really important. But in terms of increasing participation in the sector writ large, the agency also has, I think, two key efforts that are important to our discussion today. And so one is an internship program, Marie Sklodowska uh, Curie internship program after one of the most important people in all of the nuclear field, male or female, of course. But this focuses on providing internships and grants for uh, women who are working on a master's degree in a nuclear relevant field. It could be some of the STEM related nuclear fields, but it also could be nuclear safeguards, nonproliferation and security. And so uh, allowing them the opportunity to come to the agency and work as an intern for up to 12 months. And this again is just designed to ensure that we're building the next generation of nuclear experts. But I think one of the things that I've personally seen in my career is it's not enough just to ensure that we're getting women to the table um, and getting them in these positions. It's about supporting them once they are there and so just a few years ago, more recently, the IAEA created the Lise Meitner program after the famous Austrian-Swedish physicist. And this focuses on junior professionals, women that have already gotten their foot in the door, uh, but working to support them through training and networking opportunities, everything um, from you know efforts and activities, uh, tours, events, workshops, etc., to both hone their technical expertise, but also help them develop their soft skills that are really needed to be leaders in the field. And so by investing in these younger women, um, we're hopefully bringing more female leaders to the table in the long run. So there's also another um, initiative that I should mention, the Women in Nuclear Security Initiative. Uh, that's led by my division, and this is essentially a networking um, opportunity. We do webinars on a range of topics uh, and then also provide networking opportunities here in Vienna. Again, just designed to help build a strong cadre of female experts in all things nuclear. And so those are some of the ways that the agency is investing in women. Um, as you note, in the nuclear security field, just like many aspects of security, very, very mal dominated, but hopefully we can uh, change that. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Big round of applause.
I mean, it, it's, it's very impressive the, the, then, uh, the improvement that you mentioned in terms of increasing the number of women at IAEA. And it just goes to show you how important it is to have you know, policies in place and then really take action and, and put those policies really into work. And you also mentioned something very important about retention. I know uh, there's a lot of focus on numbers, getting women into organizations, getting women into leadership positions or into certain fields, but once they're there, you know, how do you keep them? How do you retain them, build and ensure that they stay? So um, it's not just about the numbers at the end of the day, so that's an important point, thanks. Let's move on to Doris now, also um, a woman in IT. Uh, you were with Microsoft. Microsoft is known actually worldwide for supporting women and supporting women in IT. Maybe you can give us a few examples concretely of what Microsoft is doing, perhaps here in Austria or maybe even globally, uh, to encourage more women and girls to pursue careers in STEM or in IT. And what do you see as the greatest barriers to uh, women in STEM and mm -hmm. IT? Yeah, thank you for the question. I mean, um, actually, yes, when we are talking about diversity and inclusion and equality, I'm always feeling like coming from the future, from American star company. It doesn't matter where you're coming from. It doesn't matter what age you have, which background. It's always where you want to go, living the American dream, right? And this is the kind of culture we have also, this American style of culture. We have more than 40% women, right? Is it enough? numbers don't speak good, right? Is it good to work at Microsoft as women is the right questions? Do you have equal chances and equal career opportunities there? And there I can say yes. And how we are shaping the culture there is really is essential to have this equality. One point which is very important is the performance management. When you're driven by your numbers and the performance with a uh, um, a company like Microsoft where um, of course our sales numbers are the ultimate goal you have to include diversity and inclusion into the performance management system. So it's part of every management performance review, it's part of every manager conversation, how are you contributing to this topic, so you don't get your bonus if you're not contributing in diversity and inclusion, and this has changed because behavior goes where measurement goes. And this was a huge change in the last three years since I'm in Microsoft to have a part of the performance management. And what we are also doing is in recruiting, of course, it's important to have female candidates from the market. The easiest excuse I always get is, especially in the security field, we don't have uh, any female applications. And I said, okay, fine, this is not an excuse. So what we are doing since years is to have a diverse board for the hiring um, decision. So no man by itself can alone or two men or three men decide for the hiring, there has to be a woman included into the hiring process. And you cannot imagine what this changed uh, our recruiting process. And the, the other thing, of course, we are also measuring um, the applications we are getting, but if I have one position open, we get like 300 uh, um, um, applications per job. 90% of it are men, okay? So this is still the case. So what we, ha we did, we hired for recruiting resources who are attracting female talents on the market and also investing into it because we see that women don't apply for the same job as men if they, they, they read it into the, in the job portal. So this is also something where we're driving the change. For the ultimate question, what are we doing to change the system? I think that the education system is very important. It starts with ground school, it starts with easy access to digital skills, and this is a society topic. Of course, we in Microsoft are doing a lot to make it easier and tangible what kind of careers you have. We are doing this a lot with role models so that you see what kind of careers you could have but this will never be enough because we as a society have to deal with our education system and make it easier accessible um, that digital skills and IT careers are super attractive also for women. Um, I personally think, living in a big corporate, that uh, changing HR, uh, HR processes and changing the kind of culture we are having 
is not enough. It is also the small things we are doing as the women who are sitting on the table. The first thing I was coming up to my mind when I got the job on the table was I want to change the table. I want to change how we behave here, but this, 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 ti this takes time. And it, these are the small things you can do every day in your work which drive a different kind of behavior by scaling with others. An example is if you're in, interrupted by a man in a conversation and this is happening in tough conversations we have in the board meetings, just state it, say it. I do not want to be interrupted. You interrupted the other woman right now. Can she please uh, following up her sentence? Um, this drives behavior change because people will not do it for a short time. It does not uh, <laughs> um, act for a long time. But um, what I'm also doing is if there's a decision process for a big contract or something, I'm looking at a diverse team. So I'm challenging the sales team, is the women included? And I also see that, that my other board members on a local level are uh, starting to ask these questions because I changed my behavior on the table. And I think that this is also necessary with all the things we have uh, in the corporate life. So the biggest barriers and challenges, I think, is in the educational system that we may have to make it a easy accessible, the, uh, the IT careers, and change the kind of picture we have of our heads that IT careers are coding mm. only because this is wrong, or I don't know, nerdish, that you're just a nerd when you're, this is also wrong. So I'm going there with my blonde hair, I'm going there with my pink dresses, I don't care about it. This is the, the new world of work where, we, where I live in, and this is also the reason why I think I come from the future when I talk about it. And uh, the challenges we have is that it's not fast enough to all this change which needs to happen. I think that we're all a little bit waiting for it, and I see the change And we t when we talk about gender pay gap and all this stuff, we want it now, but we need to a little bit also calm down and see the change happening which is now rolling forward in our society. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. I, mean, I, I liked your emphasis on authenticity and you know, what are the stereotypes if you think IT is coding and nerdy and all of that, but you know, to be authentic, you come as you are wearing pink. There's nothing wrong with wearing pink. You can be an IT coder and wear pink. I'm just saying, I, I, I like I'm, that. I'm always the color dot on the pictures yeah. I have. Yeah. With all the and, <laughs> and, and that's, that's what I always say to women, be bold and, and you know, be authentic. That's so important. And you, of course, you also touched upon very important, it's the education and how important digital skills are. And I think that kind of leads to the next question is to look at this whole question around what is the new world of work and what skills do we need? Because uh, we talk about digitalization, the fourth industrial revolution, and this, this concept of this new world of work, and are we fit for it? And especially, what does that mean for the gender divide, the gender digital divide? So um, the next question is basically to, to everyone, and if you can reflect on what you think are some of the greatest challenges and opportunities that women face in this new world of work, and what should be done so that women are better prepared to succeed in this digital age. So maybe we can start, because we'll, we'll start from the up, we'll start with Heather, and um, if you can reflect on that, this new world of work. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. So uh, yes, challenges and opportunities. Um, it is an exciting time. So. Uh, I will start, I suppose, first with, with some challenges. And here I speak in a personal capacity, and uh, this I think is a challenge, but also an opportunity for us. But I think it is important to help move the narrative from one of inclusion because it's a moral good to inclusion because it produces better results. Um, you know, I think uh, people are not going to necessarily be swayed because you're telling them it's morally important to include women. If they believed that, they're probably already including women and prioritizing their participation. However, I think that it's important to demonstrate the results on investing in women. And there is, uh, you know, a growing body of research, I think, that really demonstrates some of these results. And so uh, you and Andre were talking about the fact that war and conflict disproportionately uh, affects women, and we know that to be true. 
There is, uh, of course, a United Nations Security Council resolution um, from 2000 on the topic of women, peace, and security uh, to try to address this, but also address it in part by increasing the participation of women in peace processes and in government overall. And as part of that effort, there's some really um, interesting data coming out about the participation of women. Uh, not just the participation of women, but the results. And so we know from a lot of that research that when a woman is involved in the negotiations during a peace process, there is a 20% uh, better chance of peace lasting two years. If women are involved in the peace process uh, at a rate of 35% or higher, uh, the likelihood is that peace agreement will last for at least 15 years. It's astonishing. Um, we know that when uh, women reach about 35% of a national legislator, the risk of a relapse of uh, discord goes down. We know that countries that have higher participation of women in their national legislatures are less likely to use force to settle international disputes. And uh, you know there is just a lot of fantastic research out there that really demonstrates that ROI. And I think that's true not just for women, by the way, but for other diversity and inclusion efforts. For example, looking at, um, looking at private sector companies, there's a ton of research out there demonstrating that when the executive boards of uh, companies are diverse, they have better profit margins. <laughs> They're doing better business. And so I think if we can point to not just it's important to include women, but it's important to include women because you get better results and let me tell you about those results, I think that will perhaps change the mindset of some that we still haven't reached. Um, I think also when we think about the way that we work today and just the way the world is, uh, we have some great opportunities, I think, that hopefully will continue to increase female participation in the workforce and, and in international security as well. But, um, you know, things like digitalization of work, uh, things such as remote work policies, for all of the harms that COVID brought us, uh, it did bring for a lot of companies and a lot of countries more flexible working arrangements. By the way, I think flexible working arrangements are good for everyone, male, male or female, regardless of age. But I think particularly for women who still tend to, uh, in some cases, carry out a larger share of maybe housekeeping, childcare duties, et cetera. I think that um, the world and the workplace is changing in ways that should decrease the barriers to really effective and active participation. And so I'm particularly encouraged to see that and, um, and see how things continue to evolve. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I think, again, making the business case for for more women and, and to stress, it's not just when you, you know, I've talked about these figures too, that having more women on boards, having more women in peace processes really does affect the result. And it's not because necessarily we say, are women better? No, are they better negotiators or, or better board members? It's the diversity. And you need to have the diversity of opinion to avoid this group thing. So I think those, those numbers are very important and the research keeps growing. So maybe let's move then to the private sector since we are talking about the new world of work and and uh, and skills and you know the business case uh, maybe Tuba you can reflect on that um, yes. how do you see <coughs> that in, in Denise Bank? sorry yes uh, I was thinking about my career through 25 years when I was thinking about the challenges we face and the opportunities yes we have some rising opportunities especially after COVID we have these flexible working times we have these home offices we have some governmental support more and more, but surprisingly, the challenges we faced didn't change since I have started my career in 1998. I always worked in HR, so I'm always at the other side of the table. The most important thing I would like to, I don't want to go to digital age. First, I think we should fix these things, fix the basics. Then I think my colleagues will take you to digital age, to future, <laughs> but without the base, it's very tough. So as Lara mentioned rightfully, gender pay gap. We should be aware of this. This is something very, very serious. In Austria, currently, the, the numbers are from 2022. It's 18%. Um, in some EU countries, it goes up to 66%. So for the same job, 
same performance, males get male get predominantly higher than females. So this is something really, really serious. Uh, we, we discuss about the reasons why this is happening. Are we sheep sitting aside? Why? How can they do this? So we had some research behind the scenes, and I recently came along, uh, came along another research. And the question is to young professionals, uh, they ask, how many of you negotiated to your first job for the offer you receive, simply? And the answer is 57% of men, males said, yes, of course we negotiated. Whereas 7% of female said, we negotiated. So look at the difference, it's really disturbing. This means that we believe we deserve more than the offer, we value more, but we don't speak up, which means we don't have the confidence to speak up. And then it starts from the entry level of our careers because we are afraid to speak up. We have, there is something behind. But when I look at ladies, young, potential people shining in front of me, I don't understand. I also didn't speak up, by the way. I wasn't that brave, but this, this, I, this is, the, in my opinion, in my humble experience, this is the beginning. So we should say, we should ask for more. And I also observe the people I extend offers, males, next minute, come, oh, can we do something? No, why? <laughs> they are questioning. Whereas females are gracefully accepting with a very nice email, celebrating, congratulating, appreciating the offer. So it's time to speak up. This is really, really serious. This is the first point I wanted to speak. The second part is this metaphor called invisible glass sailing. This is also very, very valid. It was always valid, still valid. Another issue for us, this is a metaphor for the invisible barrier that prevents women from rising to senior executive positions. This is simply gender discrimination. Sometimes, when we look at the results, there, are, there is also an unconscious beh bias behind, but usually this is gender discrimination. I have seen many women and men voting for promoting women and men, both women and men promote for men. So why? Why females are seen deemed as not dependable enough? Male also live. Yes, we get pregnant, we live some for some time, but there are solutions for this. You can have succession plans, you can have temporary workforce. This is nothing. But still, this is also very, very serious. And when you check for finance, I did my homework, only one-fourth of top executives are females. One-fourth. So this is really, really serious. Overlapping duties. Of course, this is another issue. We have a lot of burden on us. Uh, women, women, when trying to progress with their careers, face diverse responsibilities from being daughters, sisters, wives, finally mothers, uh, to potentially being the sole provider for their families. We think about everything. Sometimes to even our husbands' families, we are the sole providers. I have never heard during a recruitment interview, uh, a comment that he is a father, for example. Many males, they are fathers and it's, it's okay. But she's a mother is a discussion point. This comes up naturally. And we don't question this. Yes, but and he's a father. So what? So these things are becoming normal, already normal. So we should question these things. Why I'm a mother and he's a father, so what's the problem here? And also, besides these, of course, as a working mother of two amazing sons, the obvious challenge is how to balance a successful career with being a great mom. Plus, the constant guilt of whether you really are good enough at any of them. You always have this feeling of missing something. Am I a good mother? Did I do it? What is the problem here? We question ourselves a lot, which we shouldn't. We should get support when we are lost. There are lots of professional support outside if we cannot deal with our emotions, but there is support and we can do all of it. The other two, I will not go into details, I don't want to bore you, but still inadequate financial literacy, 
This even exists for people, for women working in financial industry. Usually, the skills, uh, financial literacy skills, are considered basic or below for all of us. So it feels like it's a man's job to invest, to hold the control of the money, which shouldn't be. I have met lots of successful entrepreneurs who don't know what to do with money they earn or they get uh, as support. So this is also critically important. And lack of women mentors and networks is something that we should. This, this is really popular nowadays, but we should do more. We should be more reachable to women around us. It's a game changer. I was always very lucky to have mentors, elder than me, wiser than me, who has the objective opinion, giving me direction. You don't have to listen, but you hear other opinions. And I really, it was a game changer for me. So please use this opportunity, approach us. It's not that we know better, but we did more mistakes according to our age. So, so yes, I think these are the old challenges I think we should fix as soon as possible before jumping into digital age. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> no, I agree. That, that's a good point because these challenges seem to have been around and they're still around and we keep talking about it and talking about it. And, and when you were talking about the, the pay gap, of course, I was also thinking about, you know, why do women not negotiate? And um, then I was thinking about the imposter syndrome. I think you all are familiar with the imposter syndrome that we, unfortunately, women, why do we have it? And I mean, I have it myself. Sometimes you ask, am I good enough? Should I do this? Or you get the offer and you're grateful to get the job where a, a man feels exactly. more like, okay, you know, it's, it's a given. So I think we have to think about that and what we can do to overcome that. So maybe before jumping to the digital age, I will um, come to you, Andrea. <laughs> we'll end, with the, we'll end with, the, with the future, but maybe, uh, Andrea, if you can reflect on maybe some of the, the challenges you see in this new world of work. How does it affect the work you do? Um, yeah, and I mean, yeah, I, I try my best. Uh, <laughs> listening to Doris uh, when she said, I'm coming from the future, um, I was thinking uh, the people that we are working with, they don't have the privilege to say, I'm coming from the future. In the best case, they are stuck in the present, but most of them are coming from the past. And I'm talking about disadvantaged poor people, those for whom the SDGs really mean more than fulfilling any targets like here in, in our so-called uh, industrialized world. And when I heard uh, that COVID, and I know it myself because CARE is a global, we are one of the biggest global organizations. We are independent from faith and independent from politics, but uh, I know it myself that COVID, it was really, I heard it here, it opened windows of opportunity. You all said it, but for the people that CARE is working with and for, it closed the small opportunities they had before. And it deprived millions, not only of girls, also of boys, from education, from having access to medical, basic medical uh, uh, services. and. It was really a big challenge in all the so-called projects and approaches to overcome COVID. Yeah? Because talking about, because I, I personally, really, I love it. I would say, let's get digital, all of us. But this is really a, a first world somehow view. Yeah? Because overall, and I'm sure all the panelists know it, Overall, 69% of the global population have access to internet. 69% over, if I look at the total, yeah? 69% uh, are men. 63 globally, women percent have access to internet. That sounds good. But if we look to countries that are not so rich economically, then it drops down to 30% of men have access and 20% in average, global average, of women have access to internet. And we all know that all the 
the beauty of digitalization, of artificial intelligence and all these things work with internet. So lack of infrastructure, lack of investment into infrastructure, these are the big issues that many countries are struggling with, not only in the so-called global south. What I also was thinking, listening to my fellow panelists, is with all the problems that Tuba mentioned, and I'm also part of those problems because some of them I also faced, um, I still would say that we have all, with all the problems we face, but all of us, we have the privilege of making choices. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I don't want to spoil the good spirit here, but think only of Afghanistan. Uh, it's only two or three years ago, and women, in also before uh, the, the regime changed to the Taliban, it was not the best place to be a woman in the world. Uh, but now it is one of the worst places. And care, we encourage women all over the globe to work with us, because with a strong focus on women and girls, you need the access and you need the expertise of educated uh, women to really, it's easier in many ways. If you want to see social change, then you have to talk with people on eye level from your own culture and background. Mentioning culture, cultural barriers, they are also existing here in our, in our country. But how much, how strong are they in other countries around the globe? Yeah? And going back to Afghanistan, uh, being a highly paid staff from care in Afghanistan, for example, means nothing anymore. We, we had to make the choice, do we stay in Afghanistan for humanitarian reason, or do we leave the country? Because we had more women employees and staff than men, and from one day to the other, they were forbidden to work outside the house. Afghanistan, in a few years, they won't have doctors, they won't have lawyers, they won't have nothing anymore because modern elementary school is not foreseen. That's a structural, really, disadvantage to be a girl. And there are many more places in the world where we face these troubles. So it all starts with education. Why do women also here not speak up? Because they are not taught and not encouraged enough to speak up. Why are women so shying away from technical professions? It's not enough for any politician to say, yeah, it's very important that women study uh, science and, and, and tech, go into the tech industry. That's not enough. You have to educate and encourage them from day one. And then also the behavior will change. And talking about tech opportunities, people Many people, disadvantaged and poor people, don't have the choice to say, okay, first I do some traditional education, and then when I'm better off, then maybe also the digital world is there for me. They don't have the choice because everything is very, very fast, and they have to grab what they get. And my final statement is, we talk a lot in the development industry about access to education. I would really see uh, I would prefer to see the debate also in the development industries about quality of education that is uh, provided to people. Today it's not enough to sit in any school, even if you're in a remote area in Mali or, or in wherever, in Nepal, where CARE is having excellent education programs, especially for women and girls who are not sent to school because it is so dangerous the school, the way to school is too long, it's so dangerous, they, they keep the girls at home. So the quality of education, it's not enough to have a book to be able to read and write and do only a f a five or six years and then you drop out of school because you have to work to sustain your family. This is happening in all the refugee settings worldwide. The children, they don't have a full school career because they have to contribute to the income of the families. So talking about education means, again, meaningful education and means digitalization. And this is why it is a standard nowadays that in every refugee camp, you have to have an area where internet accessibility is provided. Even if you don't have electricity in the whole camp, because you only have it for two or three hours a day, but you have to have a space where internet accessibility is there. 
people often are wondering why are so many refugees having mobile phones? They need it. That's their only connection to the outer world, to their families, to their loved ones. That's, that's their key to communicate, depriving people, no matter where on earth. I've seen them from Cambodia to, to, to all the places I've been. Depriving people from mobile phones really cuts them off from everything. And in many African countries, uh, mobile phones are the tools where you can communicate also with your communi communities, where you do all your uh, civil service things that you have to do. So we have to change also our view on the world. We have to change ourselves. And I think we have to be much more aware that we are privileged because we are part of the shiny and nice global community but we, as women who have sort of career, I would say, we should enable millions of others to also participate because this is real mm. fighting against inequality and not only claiming what is missing because for millions it's only a matter of survival. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that stark reminder, again, how important access is, because without the access to the digital tools, not only will the gender gap increase, but also we see the disparities in, in the socioeconomic development and, and opportunities, and the example with Afghanistan is, is really blaring, so I think we need to also keep that in mind. And that ties into, again, what we started to say, how investing in women has an impact, a positive impact on societies, and when you don't invest in women, then the, the absolute detriment it has on societies. So we'll go now turn to uh, Doris for um, maybe looking in the future in IT. Um, again, going back to the new world of work, challenges and opportunities, maybe reflecting on what some has said and uh, from your perspective and from Microsoft. Yes, so I couldn't agree more with everything said. It uh, doesn't matter if it's the, the general few you bring in. I mean, we are all in the bubble and the question was more from the corporate world, what, what, what I experience in Microsoft. But of course, this does not reflect anything which is happening in the world. This is just the bubble where we are in. And it's always an eye-opener also to, to talk about topics in a broader sense. What, I gives, what, me, what gives me positive spirit about the topic is what I can change here, now, with the people around me, with the, f with the women we attract, which we are role models for, which we are showing a positive world where they could live in the future, which also is important for my, for my daughters. And the new world of work is, this is, this is a tricky one, because from my personal experience, it's a big opportunity um, when you are working and you have your kids at home, that you also be able to, to work when they are sick, that you are also, like in a, in a big uh, company like Microsoft, it feels a little bit like a telenovela when you're watching it. Every day, the same meetings, and then you are not there, lose, losing one, going to the toilet, and you don't see one of the, of the, of the series uh, which comes at the day, and then you miss out because the broken meeting is happening, and then you're coming back, and you, you think, what, is, what happened when I was at home the one day? And New World of Work gives me the opportunity to be part where I prioritize, where I see value it, and I can do my work wherever I want, whenever I want. So this is the opportunity, this is what, 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 what gives me also a positive sense about it. But it also comes with a lot of challenges. And what you said is absolutely right. I can just encourage every woman on the planet to embrace the imperfection. Um, don't watch TikTok and Instagram and think we are sitting here embracing the world, we are the super bosses, we are the super mothers, we are the super daughters, we are the super cookers, we are the super family managers, we are the super uh, putzfrauen, I don't know. You cannot be that everything, you can't. You have to set your priorities and New World of Work 
gives you some kind of wrong uh, perception how it feels to make everything perfect. And even your job, in your daily job as a woman, stop being perfect or better as the others the whole time. It's enough what you are doing and you can be proud of. Invest more time into uh, your rhetorical skills, into your negotiation skills, in your body language and how you encourage yourself every day to be part of this table and stop doing more to get a feeling and the, 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 the feeling to be enough to be also there. Because this is some kind of educated in women that we have to, to, to treat in a normal world like this. We do not have to do it. So what I'm doing for my team is I'm challenging them every day. How much time did you invest in doing the task versus how much did you invest in communicating what you did? Because this is what men are doing naturally. They're more communicating what they're doing in what what they did sometimes, sometimes. I do not want to be unfair here. And uh, when I see that there is a gender pay gap, what I'm doing is I'm just seeing um, a comparison in my department or in my organization of the people, and I'm giving extra promotions for unfair payment. Mm -hmm. And I did the first promotion for unfair payment. Was it easy? No. Did some other say it was f unfair to give this unfair promotion, <laughs> a just fairness promotion? Maybe, I don't care, but the woman was not uh, able to negotiate their own contract as, as a man would do it. And I skilled her for the next time also in a rhetorical uh, uh, training so that she has the skills to negotiate it. And it will never happen to her again. And these are the small things I can do in my daily work. And the opportunity in the new world of work is also to combine digital behavior and digital skills with the, with the real world and have a combination of both by our own priorities. So we have to set the priorities. And then I think we can be very successful because in a new wor world of work and also in the generation afterwards, people will like naturally have better skills than we have in the digital world and they can use it better. So they're also in um, a different level of digital skills and they can use it in their daily work. And I think there will also be a natural change then by, with the generation shift we have in front of us. So also here I have a positive conclusion about the topic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I think it's, it's good to end on a positive note, but keeping in, in mind that there's still so many challenges, but we need to approach them. In a, in a with a positive spirit. Now we have time about 10, 15 minutes for your questions, comments. Um, I think we have a microphone coming. Okay, we'll get the microphone. Uh, you introduce yourself when you ask a question, and if you have a question, please <laughs> then say who you would like to direct it to. And we have a microphone coming your way. Thank you. Um, more than a question is a small comment that I would like to make. My name is Yasmin Espinosa. I'm uh, originally from Chile, and uh, I had been working, I had worked at the Atomic Agency and, and also in CTBTO and in other capacities in the field of disarmament, arm control, and nuclear non-proliferation. Uh, one, I wanted to make two comments that I think are relevant when analyzing this topic that has to do that in order to analyze the, uh, the, the, the way to improve investment in women, we need to think about it from the perspective of human rights. Because uh, I think a lot of uh, the gender disparity that we experience had been perpetuated by the financial system and so on, and this has serious consequences on the human rights. Uh, another issue that I think is relevant, and I, I think this I speak a lot from my own personal experience, is that when we talk about women, we need to understand the diversity within women. Uh, I think it was highlighted in the discussion very well that, uh, that women coming from different regions, women with disabilities from different ethnic groups, we all face different challenges. And this is something that personally I had experienced in my career as a woman coming to Europe from Latin America and with a disability myself, uh, working in a field that is 
so male uh, dominated. So I think this is something that should be taken into account when implementing and designing any policy to improve investment and improving the life of women. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, Sasha. Thank you. Yes, uh, Sasha Monstein, I'm the, the previous pres president of Rotary Club, and I was in IT in a big uh, American corporate as well uh, at Pfizer. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to raise something completely different, and please forgive me. I know this is a day of celebration, but I really ask myself, what do we actually have to celebrate? Because I still remember what the world looked like three or four years ago when we started this event. In the meantime, we had, it was mentioned, we had the Taliban taking over and with probably the worst nightmare for women in the whole world you can possibly imagine. Uh, and we have, and I recently you know, had, had heard a piece of news that pointed out that there is a new culture in global politics that is, ex, that is decidedly misogynistic. It's a new thing. I mean, Trump is a, is a misogynist, Erdogan is a misogynist, uh, you know, Putin is a misogynist, and there was the, really the theory, why do we have so many wars now? You know, why is sexual uh, violence a, a, a means of war, even you know, in, the, in the Middle East, as we have seen also uh, in, in this terrible assault? Um, what has changed in these years? I think we have a global trend of a really brutal, macho, uh, ideology that is covering the globe, that is covering the globe with new wars. And I think that the disdain for women and the really explicit hatred against women is, a, is, is, is part of that culture. Uh, Turkey has left the Istanbul Accord, right? I mean, ironically, uh, in Russia they have passed legislation that makes domestic violence basically, uh, you know, not punishable anymore, and so on. I could go on, and it's incredible. It's everywhere you look, the situation of, of, of women who have fought for decades and centuries for these things are, get, are being lost. And so I'm, because we have such an international group here, and because we have this international context, I ask the question, what can we do globally against this really dismal development that we have in our world today. Yeah, thank you. Maybe we'll take two or three more questions or statements and then a uh, reaction from the audience, the panel. Hi, I'm Jennifer Adams. I'm actually an alumni of the Diplomatic Academy. I used to work for the OSCE, and now I'm an independent consultant in media policy, uh, specifically decolonization of media. And I really want to just highlight what you've said. I, I, I totally agree. I think what we're talking about here is so important. And, and the world that we live in right now, how we can promote women and how we can improve the world for women and how we as leaders can move forward for young women behind us. But I think it's also so important to notice that like, it's not about changing our, ourselves as women to fit into the world that exists. I think it's also really important to talk about the perpetrators of our oppression and to think about why the world is the way that it is. There's one thing for us to capacity build and to network and to create space for women, but that's still creating them in the structures of oppression that exist. And I think that we have to acknowledge the patriarchy and we have to look at the world and say how quickly it can be that we backslide, mm -hmm. how quickly all of our progress can be lost if we're not explicit about the people that are creating the situation for women. So as much we, as we can do as women to make the world better for ourselves and those that come behind us, we have to call attention to and penalize those people and those powers that be, which are, it looks like, the majority of the world right now really and, and use the political power that we have to leverage sanctions, to leverage uh, soft and hard power against those forces that are really against empowerment of people and women as human resources. Thank you. Yeah. Um, um, my name is Sharon. I am a student at uh, the Diplomatic Academy um, uh, doing uh, international uh, uh, environmental technology, international affairs. And my question goes to like all of you in your capacities, um, in, your, in your serving capacities, 
and it would be like what are some of the policies and um, some of the things that your companies are doing to promote the employment opportunities for me, women of color, for example, because I'm here uh, representing um, women of color. You can see the representation is just two out of I don't know how many. So, and one of the speakers talked about the fact that she's uh, supporting one girl in Africa. And I would like to say that we cross a lot of oceans to even get like a chance to get educated. And I am a beneficiary of um, like a support. And if, if, if it was not for that support, then I wouldn't be here. So, and also it goes to like, uh, to say, goes without saying that um, uh, in Africa also like women are not are really undereducated, and some of us are just like for example like in three or four generations the first degree holders. So like what are some of the um, policies that you guys have in place that really promote the uh, em like employment opportunities or or internships when it comes to for example the um, representation of African and I'll speak for African students uh, in Europe, for example, because the absorption of African students, like from some colleagues, they have to go back because they didn't find job opportunities because there's like a lot of competition. And also like, what are you doing to just like absorb those African students that have like degrees from European universities and they don't have to like, for example, go back to Africa or I don't know, find something else to do that does not really, um, it's not really related to what they studied. Yeah, thank you. So, um, why don't we now, I'm going to give space to the panelists to maybe answer the question and reflect on what has said, and then we'll wrap up and continue the conversation over uh, a, a glass of wine next door. So why don't we start with you, Heather? Okay, well, Thank you, excellent comments and questions. Um, specific to the last question, I spoke a little bit about some of the policies and programs at the IEEA, so hopefully I'd cover that. But I, I would say that when we're looking at increasing female participation, uh, whether it's actually in the workforce or via our events, we don't just look at gender in a vacuum. We also look at geographical distribution and diversity, which is critically important. Um, so that is one component, but it's a broader, more complex picture that we're looking at and outcome that we're trying to engineer. So since I spoke on uh, some of the initiatives, I, I guess I'll flip this now and speak a little bit about personally, um, because you had mentioned, uh, you know, what what can we do regionally, in particular in Africa um, and elsewhere. And so all of these policies that I talked about, of course, uh, you know, we take into account geography. I wanted to just share something because listening to your question, listening to some of the other comments made me think. And so now reflecting in a personal capacity, I would say one of the things that's been important for me throughout my career is to look at opportunities to model behaviors and model participation. And particularly when I was working for the US government, there would be certain trips or activities uh, where I would say, you know what, it is more important for me to participate in this personally because I want to demonstrate that you can have senior female executives in this sector and that they can be effective, that you can be active. I'm going to show up and not just be, you know, a female face in the photo. I'm going to demonstrate that, you know, I've, I've fought my way here uh, through expertise and hard work and I have every right to be here and I want people to see that I'm respected by my peers and I want to gain their respect. And so um, I think that thinking about, uh, and several of you hit on this, you know, mentoring but also kind of shaping that public image and demonstrating, uh, you know, what a strong female executive or leader or just advocate can bring to the table. I think modeling that every single day is critically important um, in all parts of the globe. So that's just what I wanted to weigh in there, but I welcome others. Yeah, maybe Andrea. Uh, 
I start with the first comments, and I would say we shouldn't be too negative either, in spite of the fact that we, I also think that we don't have to celebrate a lot looking at the global uh, situation. Still, individuals have to celebrate for themselves. But as a world, I also would say we have nothing to celebrate, especially today on the 7th. But what can we do? We can do something. We heard uh, from the colleague from Chile that everything is connected to human rights. I would say so too. And what we see is a total erosion of the human rights declaration. Some are saying, very old, after Second World War, doesn't serve the purpose anymore. So we have to protect the human rights declar declaration. This is not negotiable. And this is not, this is not something that is outdated. And we should really avoid the instrumentalization of the destruction of the human rights declaration. It has served its purpose, and it will serve its purpose also in the future, number one. And everybody who is in a leading position or uh, senior staff can protect the human rights declaration in not echoing what not only right-wing parties are saying, because I'm always devastated uh, when I hear what politicians in general, and many of them at the European level, uh, allow themselves to speak about. Because the architecture of Europe is the architecture of peace, and this we have to protect. Second, we see a total erosion of global institutions. Think about the UN, think about UNRWA. It was really, really a scandal what happened. This has to be solved, and then people have to go back to work. Yeah? We have to protect also large organizations and also the United Nations. We need platforms where the global community comes together and tries at least to solve or to contribute to solutions of the big global issues. Second thing. Third thing. We have to be brave and bold. When I hear the nasty talk about refugees, not only in right-wing uh, scenes, because I think that I'm not part of these discussions. You can hear it everywhere. When I hear about discrimination of persons of color, of uh, the LGBTQ plus community, don't listen to it, say, be brave and bold and say, I'm not agreeing. This has a lot to do also how women are treated. Number four, also in war, law is existing. The humanitarian law is also applicable to wars. Believe it or not, it has never been so dangerous in the history of mankind for humanitarian workers. Never. They are killed in many, many places, high numbers. When I started working in this sector 30 years ago, if you had a jacket from CARE or the Red Cross or you name it, it protected you. You know what happens nowadays? You are a target because nobody cares anymore about the institution you're working for. Life in general is not so much respected. And in war, it seems that Henri Dunant is forgotten completely. And we see it every day. So, we have to be bold, speak up, and please, this is a personal comment, maybe it's not appropriate, but I think everybody of us should think twice before going to elections, because this will decide uh, how Europe will be perceived in the future, and it's not enough to only talk about human rights when it fits in our own concept. It's really tough to defend them, when they are needed to be defended, and this is now the case. CARE has several projects on the borderlines of the European Union. Uh, the next closest is in uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, I don't have enough time, and I also don't want to spoil the evening sharing with you what you could see a few hundred kilometers south or east going to Ukraine 
or even worse, looking to the Middle East. But we should not finish in desperation. We can do something and everybody can do something. But please, let us protect the Human Rights Declaration. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> I really want to end tonight as positive as possible. Uh, to Sasha, first of all, I was thinking if women didn't vote for these guys, would they still win, for example? It's just head-to-head -head male, female voters. So that's the question I think we should all think why we keep voting is another uh, discussion point that could take another night. Uh, for Africa, I have never received any uh, candidate with African roots in Austria yet, but would be delighted to get into contact. In Turkey, we have a huge community, and we did some projects together. Here, it's very rare, but we would love to support as much as we can. And, and yeah, I think we don't have any questions. What I would like to say, to end it, to wrap up as positive or as positive, as Doris mentioned uh, in the beginning of her uh, speech, uh, it's possible to have it all, but just not all at once. So we can really have it all. We will be there. I don't want to be that pessimistic, because when we look at the history, since Middle Age, I think as far as we can read, women faced lots of, they were burning us at the end of the day. So now, at some parts of the world, at least, we are respected, and it's, it's the best we could have reached. And a lot of, there, 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 there are a lot of efforts behind this. So we should also celebrate from time to time. This didn't come easy. So this is also something. What shall I say? We should do our best, so do your best. Demonstrate confidence. This is very, very important in all areas, in career, especially in professional life. We are looking for confidence during interviews, during work life. This is something really, really needed. And I, I keep telling we should celebrate. Celebrate your own successes, little steps when you speak up for something. Also be generous with your praise and remind all the great women around you of the great things they keep achieving. Constantly, we achieve many things as well. As the saying goes, uh, your playing small doesn't serve the world. This really inspires me. So, so what shall I say? Dare to play big, and yeah, let's move on. Thank you. Yeah, I think you said it so well. I don't know what to add. To to add, I think it's important to be bold. I think it's important to be confident, authentic, be you, and um, also embracing and being, also celebrating some of your successes, even if we cannot change everything, but the little steps we have, we also have to celebrate it. And um, thank you for everyone tonight. It was really interesting to see the different point of views. It was also interesting for me to be part of it. And a lot of things which were said to today, we are talking about it every time again and again. Mm -hmm. But it's important to have these small things you can mm -hmm. take away to change tomorrow the next thing you are doing and change also your behavior you have. Mm -hmm. And I think then we will, in some years, not all at once, have the change we want mm -hmm. to have. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, we are out of time, but we can continue the discussion then uh, at, the, at the reception. But I just want to thank everyone. Thank you again to all the panelists, to Heather, to Andrea, to Tuba, and Doris, and all of you in the audience, and of course the DA and the club DA and Sage. This was really, truly a very enlightening discussion. I know we can go on because there's so much to discuss. And on that note, Let's continue uh, next door and be bold, be brave, speak up. And despite the backlash, we need to keep on, keep on fighting and we can only do it together with all of us on board. Thank you so much and have a lovely evening. <laughs>